This week on Brub Eats World. As we've gone on, you start to ask yourself, is there any people of color in this writing room? So That's so funny. You know, here she is. Yes, yeah. it's, here That's she is. <laughs> I just said to him, like, listen, I mean, I know I'm here to kind of represent Angela, but she's friends with these kids. She's not going to talk differently. She's not going to you know, speak differently. She's comfortable. So you don't have to write to a specific race for her. Like, she's like me. I mean, I kind of grew up in an all Jewish neighborhood. And so, you know, don't think of her as different. And I kind of had to like m- give him permission to not make Angela different. When this boy meets world. What up, boys? What up, bros? And welcome to Bra Meets World. When this boy meets world. Your boy meets world fan club. Fan cast? Fan club? I, I like fan club. I like that. It's just a clubhouse. <laughs> We're just hanging out, y'all. Welcome. Uh, not clubhouse. I know what clubhouse is. I don't know if you do, but a whole what? different platform. What? Clubhouse? What are you talking about? We'll have to talk about clubhouse at a later time. <laughs> no shit. Anyway, okay. All right. well, guys. Uh, it's a day for learning. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, before we get into it, you were singing a song. We are at the end of Life History Month. And... Um, we had Beyonce remind us of our roots this month. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I mean, we're recording this like early February, but by the time this comes out, yeah, it'll have been some time since the Super Bowl, but it's the week of, and I've been singing Beyonce nonstop. Beyonce taking us to country for act two of Renaissance. I'm here for it. I'm ready. And I don't think it'll be called like, Renaissance. I think Act Two will be something like a completely different word. Um, you know what? I'm sure you're right. Yeah. My favorite thing so far is that it's only been a day or two, and there's already country stations refusing to play it, and black people getting mad. And it's really? like, well, why are they refusing reason? to play they it? They said we don't play Beyonce. We're a country music station, and it's like, well, she's um, at the top of the country chart. Like she, this by, is by your she's, own rules. By this is why she's doing metric. it. Because Man. she knows <laughs> the hive is going to come for him. <laughs> you know, honestly, I think it's it's so funny because between like a, this month has been a month, but in general, the idea that we will compete in your own metrics and you'll be like, ooh, still a no. And it's like, but why? What is going on? What else do we have to do in order to get the recognition that we deserve? You know, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, in the early 80s, uh, Michael Jackson wouldn't get played on MTV. So he had to kind of make rock music in order to get played on MTV. This kind of feels very similar. Um, You know, we've had some black country artists. Obviously, Lil Nas X did a a huge uh, service with uh, his song a few years ago. But um, there's a lot. I'm seeing a lot of black country artists show up on my TikTok randomly. And I just feel like it's time that we take it back. And honestly, someone on TikTok was saying that they think Act 3 is going to be her doing a complete rock album. Yep. And I'm just like, yes, she's just going through and taking our genres back bit by bit. And I'm here for I it. I love it. I love it. I'm so excited. And I, like you were saying, like, I remind everyone, we grew up in Florida. So we are not new to country mm-hmm. music. It is like Pretty much, I I've, I know line dancing. I've been coming, it was one sure. of the first things I did when I moved to LA. I found like a country bar just cause like I had friends who were line dancing sure. and I got right back into it. So like, not only, not only are we like the originators of it, mm-hmm. I feel like once we get back in the mix, you know that we, we coming for it, you know it. And that's what I, you're scared yeah. of. Yeah, and I just feel like there's so much that like, sometimes I feel like, people of color write people things off as white people shit and be, without actually taking a look at it because you could have very easily said disco is white people shit our country is white people shit our rock and roll is white people shit not knowing that black people originated all of that because they've been taken over in so many ways so to feel like you were a part of it is maybe part of the reason why a lot of people didn't even give country a chance. But I'm hoping that this kind of ushers in the new wave of diverse country artists, as well as having a new audience for established artists who I think actually make pretty good music. Yeah, again, I like one thing going, one thing Beyonce going to do, she going to give us our flowers before the time is over. So mm-hmm. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. Yep. Speaking of giving in our flowers. Oh, today, you guys, we have such a treat for you. I, I like am so excited. So, uh, I, I fought for this interview. I like mm. made our connections. Um, and we are going to be talking to one of the very few female writers 
uh, at Boy Meets World. She is one of the, as far as I've heard of, only Black writers at Boy Meets World. Um, she was a writer on Boy Meets World for season six and seven. She wrote episodes Poetic License, Resurrection, Picket Fences, and As Time Goes By. You've also seen her work in The Game, The Neighborhood, The Connors, um, One on One. Hmm. And she even created a show with our 90s fave Brandy called Zoe Ever After. And was producer of the South by Southwest audience winner in 2002, Bitch Ass. Uh, welcome to the show, Erica Montalfo Burra. Hey! Thank you so much for doing this show. Like, of you do not understand. First of all, we've, we're in season seven. We've been doing it. I love it. And we approach this as, as you said earlier, Black people watching a very white show. And <laughs> as we've gone on, you start to ask yourself, is there any people of color in this writing room? So That's she, so funny. Here about, she is. Yes, yeah. it's, here That's she one. is. <laughs> and the That's other one. great thing is that we've always asked, like, you know, how many women were around making decisions? And so when uh, Miles told us about you, we were just like, wow, we really have to jump on this opportunity to talk to her and get her perspective on everything. So glad he when he reached out to me, I was like, oh, I would do it in a second, obviously. And Miles and I, we were on the picket lines together. So he, became, he was so sweet to come up to me. He was like, oh my God, I'm on Girl Meets World and you're a Boy Meets World. Like, we're the two black people. So <laughs> we had a major bond over that for sure. I love it. Um, we, we did our research on you and we know uh -oh. that like you were a successful exec in your own right before you even joined. Walt Disney, and then you got the Walt Disney Studios Writers Fellowship Program. Yes, I did back in the day. I mean, like it was like when you have an OG, me and I think Saladin Patterson, like the year before me. So like we wow. came from that that long ago. But that's how I got Boy Meets World. I literally was a um, a fellow. They would let you like a, a show on ABC. They would let um you know the the showrunner hire you for basically for free you got like a little stipend <laughs> and then you know to work for the season and then luckily they picked me up for to be a real writer when my when my tenure was over but yeah that was my first job and to this day it literally is i get the biggest response still to that i mean i've done a million shows since boy meets world but people are like oh my god Topanga, Corey, like everyone <laughs> I mean, everyone grew up with it you know so it's my biggest credit to this point um I disagree, but I have other things that I will come back to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you're di a different demographic has a different reaction, but I will tell you sure. across the board, most people love Boy Meets World. You know, I we've talked to a few producers now, just the kind of like what it was like to um, be a part of a show from that, that I guess made such an impact on so many people's lives. But, you know, with you, we have the unique opportunity of talking to a woman of color who was in sure. the room. Can you talk to us a little bit about like what that work environment was like, what it was like working in a, a situation that there weren't a lot of people that looked like you there? Um, and just, you know, how you found your way in the Boy Meets World uh, writer's room. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, we were, I think we were filming on the Radford lot of CBS Radford. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was, the, again, the, like you said, the only woman of color on that show. But there were a lot of other shows that were near us that, like, I think the Hugh Glees or a couple of shows that were kind of quote unquote black shows. And so I began you know, kind of walking through the lot. And people would give me like the, you know, the, the, the nod, you know, you the give nod. the nod. <laughs> you get the nod. And I used to boycott the nod, I will say, but, but now I give the nod. But they were like, where are you going? What show are you on? I'm like, I'm on Boy Meets World. They're like, what? Like, I was like the one black girl who was not on the black shows, you know? But, um, but being in that room, it was, for me, it was great because first of all, like I used my first job. So I was just happy to be there. And I would just laughed at everything. All those guys that you talked about, like Mandel, who you mentioned, you I had a conversation with, they were so sweet to me, you know, and I was like a little kid. So they just like, you know, they loved me because I would laugh at their jokes. And I think that was, I, but I would laugh, I wouldn't on purpose. I just, I, was, I thought it was funny, but I just was a good audience. You know what I mean? I think for the first season when I was a fellow, I probably didn't even pitch anything. You know what I mean? I kind of just took it all in. Um, and then, you know, once I got more comfortable and I just started pitching, but I, I'll tell you another funny story. Michael Jacobs, who was the, um, the, the show's creator, he would, he would, we didn't have, we had a writer assistant, but he would, he would like to be on the computer. So he would do all the rewrites. Like he was sitting in front of the computer as we would all pitch him different ideas. And so I was kind of brought on to be the voice of Angela, basically. I mean, that's kind of was my, I guess the gig, but I mean, obviously I wrote for everyone, but 
he would be right rewriting. He said, okay, so Angela enters and, and then he looks at me. <laughs> I would be like, says, hey, I mean, what are you, what, like, she said, like, why am I, like, what, I gotta talk about what she said when she walks in the room. You know what I mean? So he was very reliant on me to be that voice. I kind of had an interesting conversation with him early on because I just said to him, like, listen, I mean, I know I'm here to kind of represent Angela, but, you know, Angela would be like me. I mean, her, she's, I, you know, her character, her, she had traveled a lot her dad was in the, in the military. But I'm like, she's friends with these kids. She's not going to talk differently. She's not going to you know, speak differently. She's comfortable. So you don't have to write to a specific race for her. Like, cause she's like me. I mean, I kind of grew up in an all Jewish neighborhood. And so, you know, don't think of her as different. And I kind of had to like m- give him permission to not make Angela different, you know? And so, he, and I think we did a good job of just making her one of the gang, you know? Absolutely. I don't think that is given enough credit. The fact that, I mean, we've talked about it quite a few times, but the fact that Angela is like, she exists and she is black without having to be their black friend. Exactly. Angela just exists. And there are moments and times where she even like acknowledges her blackness. Like <laughs> right. there's the, right. the comedy of like, I'm, I'm now going to give you credit for like the books that Angela is reading <laughs> or, you know. Listen, we definitely, because her and Sean definitely had them. I mean, Sean is very much like the poet in the group. So we would always have discussions about what would Sean be right? Sean should be reading. Angela should be reading. Like, Cory and Devanga don't read. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> they just like, you know, like play footsie with each other. So th- we were very, you know, intricate about giving them kind of those layers, especially when they were in college and, just, you know, getting through that part of their life. Um, which I, well, I, I feel like I came in at the best time. Like I came in the adult kids time. So I mean, I didn't get there when they were super young. They were already like making their lives and going to college. And so it was really fun for me to, you know, to write for the young adults. And yeah. that was where we were made for the wedding. I mean, all of that stuff. And well, I got yeah. the good, the good, the good times. <laughs> you know, I feel like Angela means so much to such a huge community of Boy Meets World. Um, you know, I feel like there's a little bit of an internal debate amongst fans over like, oh, oh we wish they would have brought up race more or we wish we like the fact that they didn't bring it up at all. Do you have any comment on just like how you feel, feel felt about it at the time or how you feel about it now in terms of how it approached the um, interracial relationship of Sean and Angela? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think for me, I'm proud that we didn't address it because, I, 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 yeah, again, the conversation I had with Michael early on when I was, you know, coming on to kind of be her voice, I was just saying, listen, she'd be like me. Like, I don't, like, I don't talk about race with my friends every day, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if, like, my, my husband was Italian, so, like, you know, like, I don't talk, like, our issues are not about race or about being boy and a girl and, like, we, you know, boys and girls have issues, <laughs> you know, but no matter what color you are. So uh, yeah, I just I'm proud of her for that. You know, I think it's authentic to who she is. And that show, I think you know, we could have done a special episode about something. You know what I mean? Because it was TGIF. But I just think you know I, I'm proud of her as a character, and I'm proud of that relationship because they were very special for each other. And people rooted for them. Like the the fans love Sean and Angela. You know what I mean? As much as they love Corey and Topanga. So I, I'm proud of them. And I think at the time I, I probably wasn't as aware of the impact that it would have. It was the impact of the show, quite frankly. But again, subsequently, now that I've, you know, gone on in my career, I'm honestly, I'm telling you, people react to that show more than any other show I've been on. I've been on a lot of shows, a lot of great shows. So people just have a, a you know, a place in their heart for that show. Cause I think we all grew up with it. And even though I was on it in the later years, like I used to watch it as a kid with, with the first season, you know what I mean? Wow. So, so I grew up with it too, and then got to actually be on it. So yeah, it's a, it's a special place, you know, a special show. And, and I'm glad that people are finding it again. And then Girl Meets World came on. And that was, you know, lovely to see all my old friends. I kind of go back and do that. And um, yeah, it was just, it was a great experience. And it's constantly having like a resurgence. I feel like it's the show yeah. that'll never go away because, and I, to me, that's a signature of like a really good show. It's timeless. Yeah. It can connect Absolutely. with several generations. And even though we've kind of, talked about these episodes and kind of broken them down and sometimes the way that they age correctly and sometimes they didn't age so well sure um at the heart of it is a show that you can learn from even if it's like learn what not to do <laughs> right. um, and to, to that point and like where we were and where we are now a lot of our um audience have asked us or we've even observed the show didn't have the greatest track record with women writing women characters 
And I just watched Picket Fences, which is the episode that you wrote. Yeah, and one I was of like, the couple, yeah. But... Yeah, what, like, mm-hmm. you you wrote, um, I want to make sure that we give you credit for the four. Poetic License, which mm-hmm. is, like, Tony King. That was my first it. one, yeah. Yes. Um, wow. Resurrection, um, where Corey sends oh, himself oh. in Amy's Crisis. <laughs> right, that's what the, with the baby. Oh, my God, I remember that episode. Okay. That was a special episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like uh, I want to come back to that one because that one is one that if they gave you that, which is right after that announcement, I can't imagine. Like I want to know that process. But then picket fences, and then as time goes by, those are like the four that you have yeah. for IMDb. Yeah, exactly. Those are the four I wrote. Yeah, and I got the- I think got one or two a season. Yeah, because I was on for three seasons. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, and I I guess the question that I had was. Um, how, when you were writing these women characters, like I said, you actually give voice and background, which isn't something that was always done. Specifically working with the guys in the group, did you ever have to like fight for a specific storyline or, you know, have someone edit your story and you're like, that's not exactly how a woman would do it, but <laughs> we're going to let it be? Um, you, you know, actually, they were very, especially Michael was very democratic. So, you know, it was very much a kind of a hierarchy so it's like you know the, the higher level writers would get the first episodes or whatever and then I kind of get the ones at the at the end because you know, I was the lowest level writer um for the last three seasons because I I think I was I think I there might have been two other people who are on my level but I was the last one to come in like everyone had been there before me so the whole staff kind of had been there and we all stayed together for those last three seasons but I was the newest newcomer but um but they were so great about you know I would always get a script you know and it was lovely and I would you know again put my two cents in about Angela or about the girls we definitely wrote for Topanga and there were there were actually myself and a, I don't know if you know Barbie Feldman Adler she was a writer she's another female on the on the show um there was and uh, there's a, a female team so there was another two women and then there was another woman allison gibson so there was like there was a, you know, there was a good representation of women huh. there um and the guys were pretty good about listening to us They're, i mean listen we you know that relationship of corey and topanga i think specifically was very personal for, for michael because corey is michael <laughs> you <Yeah>. know so and <laughs> right. i mean he just is yeah and so that, you know, their dynamic was so much a part of his relationship with his wife or when they were dating. So, you know, we kind of let him go with that. But we, yeah, they, they were very open to us if we had any gripes about, you know, what the girls were doing. I mean, but I think those women, even like, like Rachel, for example, who came on, we tried to make her, you know, very much an independent woman and that relationship that she had with the guys, the triangle, you know, we kind of gave her power sexually and all of that. So, yeah, we, I, think, I think they were very receptive to our point of view in, in creating strong women. Love it. You know, as you look back on the show that, I mean, obviously everyone has their favorite episodes and storylines. Is there a storyline or an episode that you're just like, wow, I love that. That's fantastic television. Well, for, I mean, I love the wedding, of course. But who doesn't? Who doesn't mm-hmm. love a wedding? But of my episodes, I will just say, I really love, I love Poetic um, uh, License. I, that was my first episode. And I love, I love Sean. He's like my favorite character. So I love getting to get into his like angst. You know what I mean? Um, and then I, I love as time goes by, because I like the little, it was like a, they had like a, you know, a flashback and it was them kind of being a, a, a Casablanca, you know what I mean? It was like, it was more yeah. stylized. It was a different kind of episode, but I like to kind of do those one-off episodes where you can kind of, you know, kind of leave format basically. So that was fun. So they, they again, they gave me a lot of good episodes to do. And I was very excited about all of my, I love all my episodes. I mean, the one about the baby, I was a little bit like, that was, that was a hard one. Again, that was a story that Michael really wanted to tell. And I was honored that he let me tell, because it was a personal story, again, that had happened to him. So, you know, I was, I was happy that, or, you know, uh, honored that he trusted me with it, but, um, but it wasn't a, a funny, just a high episode, but, you know, yeah. I mean, it was definitely, and I don't, I, I like to do, you know, stories or episodes that definitely are grounded in some kind of emotion too. And I think sure. Boy Meets did a great job of that, you know, even though it was like, you know, Friday night sitcom, they really did go, you know, and, and, and ground the characters in their relationships and in their real concerns and, and issues in life. Like even with Picket Fences, like that was a, you know, a, another episode that, you know, it's it's funny, but it really was dealing with this young couple being married and they're, you know, trying to, you know, live their lives, but they don't understand that you have to earn, you know, like the things in life. Just, you, you don't just get a picket fence because you get married. You have to like work for a house and those kind of things. And I like the idea that they, we, you know, we showed them as being spoiled because they were. You know, I mean, they were kids yeah. who like parents, they were entitled, 
And yeah. that's a real thing that you don't see it a lot. So I liked that episode and that, for that reason. I love that you said that because in my notes for Picket Fences, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay. Uh, but I mean, but, to jump here. <laughs> no, no, no. I appreciate it. <laughs> I just like in my notes for that episode, I wrote, I love that you acknowledge the entitlement and the privilege that Corey has because I think one of the things that we have with the show is that sometimes it doesn't acknowledge just the position that Corey is in. And I could tell, I even told Miles when we were talking about this episode, I was like, it makes so much sense that a person of color is going to be like, no, we got to acknowledge that you don't just get everything handed to you. You need to work for it. Absolutely. And your parents, and I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, finish what you're saying. Oh, I was just going to say, and that his parents, who also are working class people, would have a similar kind of lesson that they wanted to instill in their son. Absolutely. Yeah. And for that very reason, it's funny, there's an episode, I think it was, I can't remember the name of the episode. Maybe you guys probably know better than I do. But where Corey, um, him and his dad have a big issue about, this is, I think, I think it's episode, I don't know, it's season six, I think. But Corey and his dad have a big fight over, like, him not appreciating what his dad has done and worked very hard. And yeah. remember, like, the, and at the end, like, his season sister's six. on. Right, season six. And his, and his uh, sister's on, on stage and he gets up and sings to his dad that, you know, you're my hero, whatever that was. But um, but but that relationship kind of started. You know, we start to you know delve into that relationship as he's getting older because right, you're right. He just he didn't realize like his dad's worked for all this stuff. I mean, he he didn't come from you know money like not not that they have money, but it's like you know he he comes from a like working class background versus you know Corey is in an upper middle class you know home and like he gets everything that he wants. He's going to a nice school, so you know for him to be schooled about that from his dad in that one episode. I really, really liked that. That, that was even my episode, but I love that. Good lessons. We love those, like, we yeah. love those life lessons. And I think, again, I think those lessons are the ones that like help keep the show around. Sure, absolutely. Um, okay, so here's a question. Mm -hmm. Season seven, you're in uh -oh. the writer's room. <laughs> They're like, hey, this is our last season. Are you freaking out? Are you like, where do I, what's my next job? Are you planning ahead? It's, it's funny. I don't even know that we knew it was the last season early on. I think we always think that it might get picked up again. Because I think even season six, we thought it might, you know, any season after six, when they, after the wedding, it was like, okay, this the wedding could have been the end of the show. You know what I mean? To Cory Topanga go off into the sunset. But they can't, people kept coming back and wanting more episodes. So I think we, you know, we were we were thrilled to do season seven, and then I think there was a talk of season eight, but then it didn't happen. So yeah, I don't know that we knew a hundred percent that it wasn't going to be a season eight because it's like that's the show. I'm t like you said, that it's the show that keeps on going. That and the <laughs> game are the two shows that I've been on that never go off the yeah. air. <laughs> so. Okay, you brought it up. I was going to wait. I promise you, I was going to wait. But you brought up an iconic show, at least for my demographic, yes, which is sure. the game. Uh, you yes. were an executive producer for the game. And uh, I want to know, are you responsible for girl Melanie being a mess? <laughs> well, listen, a lot of people on the game would say the girl Melanie is me. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, it's all coming very, out. <laughs> yeah, she's very much, because um, I'm a daddy's girl and I was you know, raised in a very kind of affluent you know, background. And I was married to a basketball player a long time ago we won't go there but um <laughs> so, so yeah i remember we had this discussion about the dynamics of the women and dynamics of the relationship and sometimes people would say oh my god romelia is a pain in the butt you know what i mean she, like, too much with derwin i mean obviously mm -hmm. um she you know she just was like she wanted what she wanted right yeah. and i would i would explain to people that you know melanie has a father that's why she is here. She, her father taught her that she's special and that she, you know, she, she deserves X, Y, and Z. And so that's, and she acts accordingly. So that's the, the impetus behind her annoyingness is that she's a daddy's girl. And she was told that, you know, that her shit don't stink. Excuse my French. Yeah. <laughs> so she works, she moves through the world that way, especially in her relationship. So when Derwin doesn't treat her like, you know, the princess that she is, you know, she's going to feel some certain way about it. That and is that's consistent. so insightful. I love it. Like just yeah, looking yeah. at that show with that <laughs> lens of like, all right, it's not just that uh, uh, Melanie is um, behaving a certain way. She has, be it's because of her daddy girlness. It's because exactly. of what she knows to expect that, and that disconnect between what she knows to expect and what Derwin can provide that is Absolutely. constantly attention. 
that's exactly the dynamic. And again, I mean, she's entitled just like Corey, you know what I mean? So, sure. you know, they're, they're both entitled kids whose parents taught them that they deserve the world. And then the world tells you something different. You know what I mean? And that's why I would tell my parents, like, you didn't tell me the people were going to not treat me you know, nicely when I was got out into the world. Like, oh my God, it's horrible out here. So I think that, <laughs> I, lo I love that, you know, that they both are kind of conquering that. Um, I, you know, interestingly, those two characters from two different shows are conquering that in adulthood. You know, you have a show like Boy Meets World, or you also worked on The Connors, um, and then you have shows like One on One, The Game. You were saying when you approached Angela, you didn't want to write her as like her race to be front and center. When you're dealing with these quote unquote black shows, I, I, a lot of these storylines are universal. Do you find that racial issues are having a specific perspective comes into play? Or is it just like, hey, we need to tell a good sitcom story that's universal for everyone? Yeah, it's so interesting. That's such a good question. Because I, if I think about all the shows that I've been on, I mean, like the Connors is, is wider than Boy Meets, Boy Meets World. But there were several you know, black characters. Like one character marries a black person and they're, you know, in a, they have a, an interracial daughter. Um, and so, again, we didn't point it out specifically, but, you know, there were a couple, you know, we would do jokes about it, you know, things like that, or like, you know, this is the white people shit or whatever, like those kind of jokes, you yeah. know, what you would do on the Connors, but never was it a storyline at all because they were, I mean, this was a family and they were all like, like, you don't talk about that in your family. You know what I mean? If we could have bring it outside and, you know, source in to have, you know, whatever the story would be if someone like, you know, called this person a whatever n-word or whatever that like, we could have done stories like that but i don't think that was stuff that they wanted to go into i think it was just like this is a version of a family and this family is all you know dealing with their issues because they're you know that's that they're you know not lower middle class but that was a family that didn't have a lot of money so it was interesting to see that stories were told from that perspective as opposed to you know having the privileges of the other of the other characters and on the game i think you know for us we had an interracial marriage in that show as well you know <laughs> kelly and jason and we never really discussed that either. There'd be jokes about it, you know what I mean? But it was never part of their relationship. And even they had their daughter, we, you know, we would joke about, you know, her about, you know, Olive Pitts. <laughs> we called yeah. her Olive <laughs> for that reason. But, you know, it was, it was never like, you know, driving the stories by any means. I mean, Kelly was always just is a part of the group, you know what I mean? Her and Tasha, I mean, her, yeah, her and Tasha were like, you know, cohorts. So yeah, it was never, it's never been an issue. And I, I don't know if that's by design of the people who created the show, but, you know, I, I've never been on a show where it's like, oh, let's make a point of this, you know. That's good. I think that, like, as far as we're concerned, you're right. A lot of stories, if they're good stories, they translate. There are yeah. certain times where you feel like the need to acknowledge. Like I said, there are moments yeah. where, like you said, that's some white people shit. And it's like, yeah, right. I need you. I need you to right. acknowledge that Angela's not just going to sit by and let that fly. Right, exactly. But it yeah. doesn't have to be her defining attribute. Right. Um, um, and I guess and, one and to of that point, though, too, I mean, I guess uh, to make a more political statement about it all, I mean, most except for the game, I mean, obviously, you know, Mara created the game. But um, but in most of these shows, you know, they're network shows, those those stories, they they kind of shy away from too. if you're making it a full on, you know, I mean, you've heard of stories about Kenya and Blackish and things that, you know, don't get through the network. So it might be a hot button topic for some of the showrunners to, to go that way. So that's maybe why they, they shy away from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just never been something that we wanted to create a story around. Jokes, yes, but stories, no. I think it's just really interesting because what I'm learning from talking to you is that the quote unquote white show and black shows really approach their structures very similarly. And the only thing that's different is probably just the cast. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, listen, if they're good shows, like you said, if they're good shows, they're good shows. Like, there's good black shows and bad black shows. There's good white shows and, and bad white shows. And I hate it, that it to be, has become that, especially in comedy. I think comedy is the last fashion of segregation. I mean, you can yeah. watch any FBI show or Grey's Anatomy or any drama. There's a million different colored people, and that's that's the world. But in, for some reason, comedy is, you know, still segregated to some extent. And I think because 
you know, I, I, to, to use the old the old joke structure, like black people do this and white people do this. You know what I mean? It's like there, there may be, but I think this the gap is closing. I hope you yeah. know with um there's like with shows like The Bear, for example. Like I love that show, and I think that's a very organic you know way to bring races together. You you would be at, in a workplace and have a, you know different races there, and you can still you know they don't they talk about it necessarily, but it's very clear in the way that the the characters act that they're from, you know, diff they come from different places, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think it's very effective. The same way if you, if you watch The Office, you know what I mean? Like they don't hit that on the head either, but it's very clear that, I, I'm so bad with the character names, but that the black guy's just like, this is some white people shit every day. Yeah. That's his the look on his face. It's like, you know, what, these people are nuts, you know what I mean? And he wants to go home and tell his family about it. So, yeah. you know, but, you, but they, they don't do it. They don't say that, but it's, yeah. like, it's very clear in the attitude. And so I think that's a very effective way. And I hope comedy goes more in that direction without being so, you know, segregated. But I get, you know, listen, the game to me, again, I was on it for seven seasons. So it was the longest gig I've had. Um, and I'm very proud of that show. But I think that was very specific too, to this world of football. And if you look at the football, you know, with the NFL, it's like 80% black. So it's not, you know, it's not unheard of to have 80% of the cast be black and then, you know, have like a couple of white characters. But um. But yeah, it, it's indicative of the world we were trying to create. Sure. I love that. You made me, I don't know if I ever put two and two together that it's specifically comedy that is segregated segregated because you're right like scandal or like all these yeah. other shows like you can watch those and everybody is involved and they're like absolutely in but for yeah. some reason comedy has to be like and black people do it like this and white people do it like that <laughs> and i never even yeah. uh, uh, thought of that but that said i i think that one of the things we've talked about specifically with like a show like living single versus friends mm -hmm. where it, a lot of that the comedy translated, but right. the marketing wasn't put behind. Right, right, right. Recently, Issa Rae pointed out that studios aren't really trying to promote our stories. Um, and I guess my question would be, what has your experience been with that? Like in terms of like, I'm just trying to write. I like I can and I have a history of writing for both audiences, and yet the promotion is different. Yeah, it is different. And it's, listen, I mean, you know, you don't want to get into all of the, of the, of the you know, minutia of it marketing wise, but there is, I mean, have you heard in the back in the day, I don't know if they still do this, but, you know, networks when they were failing, like, like the CW, though, they would come to black shows to like, get their numbers up, and then they abandon them because yeah. once they get their numbers up. So, you know, there's a method to all this madness, and it's all about money, for sure. Um, and I think that they don't put as many marketing dollars behind black shows because, you know, they want to put it towards whatever shows they think, you know, they want to represent them more so. And it's, and it's too bad. I think it's changing a little bit, but, but this whole landscape is changing just because, sure. you know, the streaming and all of that. I mean, there's, you know, I think people are trying to figure out like what their model is and what they're going to make money from. Cause right now, not a lot of television, you know, is making money, especially on the streaming side. But, um, I hope that you know, that the idea of storytelling becomes something, like Issa said, that is is more important than, like, I mean, of course the dollars are important, but representation is important too. And I think that we are consumers like anyone else. A lot of people buy a lot of stuff. And um, and again, for what I'm writing to answer your earlier question, like I, I tend not to kind of try to make my characters a specific race, even though it's usually someone you know, if I'm writing a woman, like I, the show I created called The Way Ever After, Brandy was a star. And, um, you know, it's based on things in my life that happened, you know what I mean? So, you know, of course, a, a woman of color is going to represent my point of view better because of my experiences. But usually my life is much, you know, is, is again, I was married to someone who's Italian. So my life is much more racially integrated. And so most of my stories are. And I mean, maybe that's why, you know, there's not a lot of stuff on the air, but... But I mean, I, I'm not going to change my point of view. You know what I mean? So, so I, you know, that's that's just gonna. I'm gonna do me, and then we'll, you know, hopefully one day they'll catch up. A hundred percent. You know, I'm so glad you brought up Zoe Ever After because we are oh, such no. die-hard <laughs> Brandy stands. Um, I mean, who isn't? Everyone loves Brandy. I mean, in the '90s, she was everything. We talk about her Cinderella uh -huh. all the time. Just this, oh, like, she God. comes up a Hilarious. lot on our podcast. Funny enough. <laughs> oh, um, really? Yeah. Listen. <laughs> Brandy is like our share. Yes. I, I was say, <laughs> wow. We always say right? like Brandy. <laughs> so true. She dated. She was like the it girl before Beyonce. Like oh, anything 100%. and everything that Brandy did 
every black girl I knew wanted to be involved, wanted whatever she was doing. Absolutely. Like she could do no wrong and she was involved in everything. Yeah, M to the O to the yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. come on. Yeah, we and all And how yeah, cool all to have her be the personification of you on the show that you created. Um, you know, what's that transition like in terms of like, okay, I'm ready to create a show. How do you go about doing it? Do you have to, you know, talk to networks? Do you have to get other people involved? What what's that process like? Yeah, I mean, there was a long time between Boy Meets World and, and Zoe Ever After. So it was, you know, I worked yeah. a lot in between. But I will say, like, for me early on, like, I, after I left Boy Meets World, I went to uh, My Wife and Kids with mm -hmm. uh, Damon Wayans. Um, and then I went, I, I had met Unetta Boone, who created One on One there. And so then I went to One on One. So I, you know, I made a lot of, I went to a lot of different shows and kind of learned from great showrunners like Unetta. Um, she was a great mentor to me when I was on One on One. And that was my first time that I sold my first pilot. Like I sold a pilot to HBO. And I always joke, <laughs> I always joke, um, I'm like, I sold that pilot to HBO 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I was a very similar LA girl. I grew up in LA. It was a very similar LA girl and her friend show that I had sold. I sold them that show three times. And it was interesting back in those days, like it was more about how, who would, who we could cast going back to the casting of Brandy. Like it, you have to get someone like a Halle Berry or somebody to play to get something green light at HBO because they were much more talent oriented. Um, and I love that they now, you know, have people like Issa who, you know, have different, you know, backgrounds versus like, you know, had, had not, not having to be like a, a, a famous actress. Like she had her, 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 her followers, you know, from the internet or whatever. So it was a very different model. Back then you had to get some big star to green light your project. So anyway, with that said, I started developing very early on. I mean, I think when I was on one-on-one, -on -one, I was like, you know, a story editor or something. I was still like mid, lower to mid-level. But I started getting all this development um, success, really. And then, again, having a mentor like Unetta helped me through all that. And then when I got the game right after one-on-one, -on -one, I spent seven seasons there. And so I, <laughs> and I ran it in season six and seven. So I like grew up, like me and Kenya and Kenny Smith, like we all were like, developing our own stuff but they were kind of staying on on a, on the game and moving up the ladder so when mara left to go do um being mary jane that's when i took over running the game so i i got to be a showrunner because i having been there so i learned i cut my teeth on running the game in season six and seven so once i left you know they of course BET came to me and wanted me to do my own show so it was really kind of like making those relationships and learning from great showrunners like unetta like mara you know, how to run a show, especially as a woman. It was really lovely. They, they very much, you know, were sharing the wealth with me. You know what I mean? They weren't like mm. hiding the ball. They were very much mentoring me and very much, you know, um, uh, encouraging of my talent and all that. So, you know, it's, it's rare because I think you know, there was a time when like, you know, especially black women writers, it was like, you know, fish in a barrel kind of thing, like only one person's gonna rise to the top. But those two women really, I mean, you know, I, I I give them a lot of credit for my career. They really were mentors to me and helped me get to where I am for sure. That's so great to hear because um, we already know what it's like when you have good ideas and you're trying to get forward and not a lot of people, specifically when you're a person of color, like take mentorship or like are able yeah. to find mentors. So to be able to get mentors, but not only mentors, you were talking about like Kenya and other people who are like in your class. How does it feel to like, look around and be like oh i've I, like i've seen what you were doing well, i hate kenya no I'm kidding <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like why does kenya have a billion dollars now like, why a billion dollars? Yeah, i just joke with you but he's like you know he's like my little brother like we dev all of us came up together so it is when i say oh my god he's got another show like what's going you know but but i'm happy for him of course and he deserves everything but yeah it was it was a special group of people like the game we all kind of were on it forever you know we, it was the same group of people coming up and we were all you know, selling pilots and having successes and stuff while we were, you know, still in our class. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, and Mara did a great job of picking talented writers. I mean, you know, it's a great pedigree. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was, it's, it's nice to see Kenya doing well, but I believe me, I saw part of me goes like, where's my billion dollars? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> The game ain't going anywhere. Just keep spinning off that I universe. Know. Yeah, <laughs> Listen, we, yeah, seriously. I, that, that, I can't even believe it was back on. And I was on on uh, Paramount Plus, right? As a, yes. as a drama. Yes. Yeah. I ran into Wendy not long ago either. She's like, when I was on the Connors, because we were on on the, the Paramount lot, 
And she was like, girl, you you study work. And I'm like, it's over you. <laughs> I know. Wendy is not one to talk when it comes uh, to uh, working. Wendy stays working. Stays working. As she should. As she should. Tony, uh, there is one question that I, I was giving to you, so I will let you ask it. Oh, okay. I have to ask <laughs> you about bitch ass. Oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you know, you we did? were talking about this before. I have not seen it yet. We she showed me the trailer for it before we hopped on this call, and I cannot wait to watch this movie. Watch it. Um he's hugely all, into horror. I'm, and so that's why I was like, oh, you have to check this out. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I'm such a horror nerd. To see Tony Todd in this is so exciting. Um, just like, what was it like working on a scary movie? Like how, what was that like? It's so funny because it's not my genre at all. Like I'm not a horror fan at all, but the person who wrote and directed it, Bill Posley, um, he and I met on The Neighborhood and he and I became fast friends. And he's like my little brother at this point. And he's so talented. So remember that name, but he, he wrote it and he was, you know, wanted to you know get me on as a producer because again i've been a little bit of a mentor to him so i went on as an exec producer and we did the whole you know uh, independent film circuit which was so new for me i'm so used to being in the television machine you know i mean it was not independent at all um but it was great and we got into south by southwest and we won like, an audience award so it was really it was really fun it was fun being a part of that process to the point that i would like to do it again i mean i really <laughs> And then, yeah, I really fell in love with like that independent film thing. It was really fun. We're always here about connecting because you know, writer is hugely into horror as well. That's I know, I know. <laughs> and, it's so, and I ran into those guys that was Will and Ryder and Danielle. We're all we we're all picketing on. We had a, they had the Boy Meets World ticket special or whatever. So we all went. And um, and Will's like Mr. You know, voiceover Batman or whatever. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. They, they've all gone to do great things. I'm proud of them all. Yeah, uh, Tony knows this. I was actually at that uh, reunion, that writer's reunion. Oh, were you? Uh, in yeah. the photo, I'm actually behind the sign. No way. I had really big sweat stains, <laughs> and I didn't want that to be in the photo forever. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But, That's yeah, great. Absolutely. Um, oh, too bad we couldn't have met then. I, I honestly, you know, I think that at the time, I was so shy and overwhelmed. Like, I was, in, in fact, we had just finished recording uh, because we had been on Pod Meets World, we're on at the end of every season. Okay. We just re finished recording our second uh, guest spot with them. And then like the next day I showed up and they were there and I was like, I don't want them to think I'm stalking them. So I like, like literally just like <laughs> went really quiet. They would have loved it. They would have, because they, they have their own podcast too, right? If you yeah, yeah. Talk to, yeah. 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 Because they were talking about us going on, all the writers going on there. But yeah, it was so fun. That was, I mean, again, it, it was one of the best times, you know, creatively and like, you know, career wise for me was that it was a wonderful way to start a career, you know, being on that show. Such a fantastic career uh, throughout. Uh, what are you working on now? What do you have in development? What's coming up next? Well, listen, I have a couple of things coming up, which I can't really speak about the shows because, um, you know, they're not secured yet but um yeah just developing a lot and i have, I have a podcast actually interesting Ooh. enough that's about to come out my who doesn't have a podcast right but <laughs> um but i um during the strike i was pitching something do you know lonnie love the comedian yes so, yeah. so lonnie and i were pitching something we had a, a show we were pitching and then the strike happened so while we're striking together you know we were like oh let's forget this let's go get a drink at like the solo house or whatever so we go have a drink and we're talking about this character that i was creating for her and I was like, this can we we can we should just do a podcast because yeah, character's point of view was like she's this woman and of a certain age, you know, of color, and she just like you know was reclaiming her time because like now she can say whatever she wants. She just, you, know, you have to listen to her husband or listen to the world. She's like, this is my time to speak my truth. And so we, now we have a podcast coming out called Grown Ass uh, Grown Ass Women Talking Shit, but we do about the shit part. <laughs> and um, so yeah, just me and Lonnie talking about what we want to talk about and not being censored at all so and she's really I'm, I'm kind of like she's like the whoopee she's the moderator so she got you know and i just come in with, i come in with my hot takes i'm like pew, pew, pew. and then we have we have a guest on every episode so it's really fun and it, again going to like my new experiences i love the independent film thing and i'm loving this podcast it's really fun doing it with her so that's going to be coming to uh, wherever you get your podcast no, we love that. That's like great. you're like learning, you're doing new things, and it's always interesting yeah. and important to know that like just because you had success in one avenue doesn't mean that you can't like venture out. 
And it's exactly. also it's also interesting to see that you're having so much fun doing things like independent film and podcasting, <laughs> which doesn't really involve like a network or a studio system. No, exactly. It's very freeing. One hundred percent. That's exactly when I think during the, the you know the the uh, strike is really where I was kind of like you know pivoting a little bit because you know I had was lined up all these projects and then all of a sudden like you got to be on strike. So you have to kind of learn to pivot in your life and. As you said, you know, making a full circle conversation, like, you know, I started out, I'm an MBA, I was working in the corporate America, and then I pivoted to become a writer, because I knew I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. Like, I was, you know, in my 20s being like, I can't sit in this cubicle for like, you know, the rest <laughs> of my life, I got to get out of here. So, you know, you just have to listen to yourself and go like, you know what, like, I'm, this is, you know, something that I need, I want to do. And so let me make it happen. And I, that's what I did. And, me, and for me, again, things are always like about happiness. Like for, like, you know, like if I'm unhappy, like in a show, then I will leave that show because life is too short. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be able to do that now. But, um, but also just, yeah, there's so many different things happening. I do think our industry is changing so much, you know. Um, so, you know, who knows like how many, especially like going back to the comedy of it all, like there's so few comedies now. And that's like my you know, area of expertise, that's my, my credits, but like, you know, I pivoted to, to dramas, like I sold a drama last year, you know, so, and again, the, the game was kind of a drama too, but, you know, so you kind of have to bob and weave into where you can make a living and where also you can be creative. So, you know, I'm happy to, you know, to see, I think a few comedies are coming back, but, but it's a real tough time for comedies. There's not a lot of, um, of these streaming shows, or these streaming networks are doing comedies and there's only like three or four broadcast comedy so you know there's not a lot of comedy jobs out there that's funny like in a in a time where the bear is in the comedy category <laughs> right I know. exactly exactly but i mean listen i mean all those streaming shows like atlanta is a comedy you know i mean like but they are i mean i like those kind of i like you know i like comedies that are grounded in reality and like when i when i sell something of my own it's usually more in that vein like my development is more in that vein um but you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's still a market out there for multicams. There really are. I mean, the neighborhood does very well. All this, all those CBS shows do really well. I mean, Connor's on ABC, but the CBS shows do really well, especially like, like my parents will just turn on CBS and just watch everything. <laughs> like, they'll watch the, the, everything through the news. You know I mean? yeah. so, so that, that demographic is still out there. Um, but it'll be interesting to see like, you know, where things go and we have to be able to, you know, to pivot so you can like survive. Sure. I, I think, think that's like, also great advice yeah. for upcoming writers who are getting into Hollywood right now when the landscape is changing, just to, to be flexible and be ready to pivot. Absolutely. And be resourceful. Like, again, I think to your point, like, you know, when I came up, it was like, you know, I was in the Disney fellowship and then I got it. You know, I was very much in this institution, you know what I mean? And so I came in through a very, you know, got on, you know, all these network television shows and that's been great, but I was very indoctrinated that that's how you had to play the game, you know, or a lot of people come in as assistants or whatever, you know, and climb up the ladder. So, you know, I took a very kind of, um, you know, traditional path which was there when I was, when I came into the game. But one of the things that I have to tell people, like kids come to me now and they're like, how do I, you know, how do I get a career like yours? I'm like, I don't know, because I don't know that there's the same pathway now. I don't think that that pathway exists anymore. And that's what this whole strike was about, was us trying to keep our profession viable for new people. But they're really, it's, it's hard to get in now and it's hard to, create a 20 something year career like I have, you know what I mean? Because it's just, there's not as many shows and, and there's even talking about the bear, like when was the last, what was last season? Like that was two years ago. Like, yeah. you know, those, those shows don't like even, you know, produce enough shows for you to make a living on. It's a gig economy. when you're working on a show like that, you got to go get another show. Like when I'm doing boy meets world, 24 episodes a season, the Connors, 24 episodes, the neighborhood, like that's a, that's a living where you don't have to go out and get another job with, for the four months that you're off. So it's very different. And I, I and I, you know, unfortunately I think that's going to be the way it's going to be the bears and the, 10 episodes and you're going to have to get several jobs to, you know, to keep your life going, you know, but that's, it's just, you know, it's a hustle now and that's, it's hard, much harder. I love that. Like that answered my question. Like earlier, I was going to ask, <laughs> and Tony, you totally, no, I wanted to know, like, what would you, would you tell um, the next generation? So, and hearing that is very insightful and helpful. That's something that Mark Blutman is always talking about. He said, really he striked specifically because he was like, I had a career, but I would like for someone else to have the exact same security Absolutely. that I had. 
Absolutely. Um, so I guess like one of my final questions would be, what are you watching? Like what's the last good television or movie show that you did watch that you're like, yes, that's is, this is like what I want more of and what I enjoy. Well, I've already said the bear, which I yeah. love, you know, I mean, and I, again, I'm like, when is it coming back on? Jeez, when is season three? <laughs> I have to go back and watch season two because I forgot what was going on. Um, and then I love, like, you know, um, that, that was it, uh, uh, Succession was, like, you know, one yeah. of my favorites. So good. And I'm, yeah, so good. So I love those. I mean, I love, I love it a good drama, you know what I mean? But I'm definitely more of a, you know, a streaming kind of girl. You know, I don't watch a lot of broadcast television. Um, but yeah, those two. I mean, I used, I used to love Atlanta too, but like that's not coming back, I guess. Yeah. So you know, I'm missing. I'm missing those shows. You know, I'm missing like my like the thing that I watch, like my my uh, appointment watching. You know, Curb is back. I love Curb Your Enthusiasm, so I watched yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so that's been fun. I'm happy that's back. That's going away too. So like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna be watching next. I watched um, I watched the new Sex in the City thing. That's not on right now either, but. It's horrible, but I was like, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm so here funny. for it. So many people <laughs> say it's bad, and I'm like, I think it's doing exactly what it wants to do. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but it, it it did limp towards being watchable. <laughs> yes, it's, bar it's barely watchable, but I'm here for it. I mean, I'm, I'm grandfathered in on this, guys. Come on, that's it. like my that's my life. That's that's how I grew up. I grew up watching that show, so I'm like, I'm in. I'm, I, you can you can make the worst episode ever. I'll still watch it. I got no ex going with Carrie. I gotta know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tony, did you have anything else? Uh, you know, I, I really think uh, you were able to answer so many of my questions today. Uh, you know, oh, I, I think the one thing I just want to say is that, like, it's so cool for you to take the time to talk to us. Um, you know, we have been, you know, obsessing over this show and, you know, especially since the writer strike happened, really trying to talk to the people behind the scenes and get the perspective. And I think it adds so much to um, the way we even view the show now. Like, we're watching episodes of Boy Meets World and we're like, oh, you know what? After talking to Manel, after talking to Blutman, like I love this to, Manel. I we're able to kind of like <laughs> understand things about the show a little bit differently, and I think that perspective well, goes a long way for the diehard fans like us. So, well, well first of all, let me just say to you guys, I, I love what you're doing. Like, Bra Meets World, the best <laughs> title ever. I mean, it tells you exactly what the show is. I mean, it's it's perfect, and I love that there's like diverse fans out there because you know we don't pay attention to that but there are there's so many people who grew up with boy meets world you know across the spectrum so i'm so happy that you guys are doing this and making it clear that pe black people watch boy meets world too exactly <laughs> there's, like, there's a lot of us out there we've been going to the live events you know like you said oh, good. uh the Danielle, Will, and Ryder, they've been doing their podcasts and going yeah. around the country we've gone to a few of those and we've been able to connect with people from all walks of life at these shows who 30 years later still can't get over how great it was written, how great it was performed, how that. great it was produced. And yeah, it's so I, lo I love there. that. I love that. And I'm so, I'm really proud of the show. You know, I'm proud of all the shows I've done. So it's really been a, a nice, you know, career, but it's like the way it started with that show set the, set the, you know, the tone for, for the things I've done since then. So I will always love Boy Meets World. So thank you hey. so much for taking the time. <laughs> like, thank you for all the work you did with wow. Angela for bringing her character, for bringing lots of characters who look and sound like us to the screen and allowing us to tell our stories that aren't always what networks would have thought our stories would have been. Yeah. Well, you're Absolutely. very sweet to say that. And I hope I will continue to do that. And you guys have to continue to, you know, to demand it for sure. Um, that we will. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good. One good, thing good. we are, it's demanding. <laughs> I love it. Like hey. girl Melanie. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erica, for joining. Thank like, you, Erica. What a cool fucking episode. Cool episode. So informative. So exciting. She had such great energy. Yeah. Um, and I, I just honestly like You I'm know what's amazed. so funny? I got so many Angela vibes from her yeah. just from the way she spoke and she carried herself you could just tell there's like the, even when she was saying about the game you know like there's bits of her dna in the characters that she writes and you can almost see that when you talk to her oh 100 percent. now i will have to live mm -hmm. with the fact that i was like why is melody messy and she's like melody is based on my life and i'm like oh well <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless i will say like it was very much like I was looking at her being like, I understand why you would be able to, to be the voice of Trina. I yeah. understand why 
uh or, or angela but i also understand after we um uh, stopped recording we talked to her and she was like she and trina were able to connect and talk to each other and i was like no i get that like you and trina feel like you would have something in common so, definitely yeah that, that's absolutely great. i just think it's so cool just to know that like you know we've been asking this question about you know the role of women and you know clearly there was a lot more of a woman female presence in the writer's room than maybe we first thought and i'm glad that she was able to give us that insight but also just this idea of just like you know how the role of representation the role of you know angela's backstory and her voice like was that something that was given consideration and it's from this interview clear that michael jacobs took angela seriously so much so that he like really took it upon himself to recruit a writer to give her a more realistic voice. So, you know, I, I think there is something to that, that, you know, as a fan, I can walk away from and be like, wow, that's really cool that they felt the need to invest in Angela and build her out that way. Absolutely. And then another thing that she shared with us um, once we stopped recording was that Michael was very key in like making sure she stayed on the writer's staff. Mm -hmm. Like it was something where we talked about she had been, uh, invited in because of the fellowship and then after the fellowship kind of ended Michael went into his own pocket to keep her on and I think that that does show the respect that he felt Angela deserved mm -hmm. that does mean he ask questions on like why Angela wasn't around for the last episode but that's a question we'll have to ask someone else <laughs> that's a question we'll have to ask Michael next week guys man don't don't be saying that you can manifest it but don't be signing up for stuff that i can't deliver um, all right you guys thank you so much for listening to this episode we hope you enjoyed it uh and if you didn't we did so uh, we have the best time this is truly like i geek out every single time we get to do one of these i hope our fans that you're getting something cool out of this because um you know the insight and the perspective like we were t saying to her they really have changed the way i view each episode yes. of the boy meets world and i yes. think that's so cool absolutely um you guys as always you can reach out to us at brum meets world at mm -hmm. com or at brum meets world on all of the social platforms you guys continue to support us on uh patreon which we are appreciating if you want to hear our pod meets world reacts that's where you will see this if you well this and more pod meets world reacts will be on patreon uh, and then you can also subscribe to our youtube and ultimately just we appreciate you guys. We thank you guys for appreciating us the same way that we appreciate Erica. Erica, thank you so much for coming on. Um, happy Black History Month, everyone. Happy Black History Month. <laughs> and uh, we will see you on the flip side. I think this is the time where we tell them to dream. Well, if we're going to tell them to dream, we should probably tell them to try. And um, as long as you're on Beyonce's internet, do good. <laughs> dream, try, and do good, y'all. Later, bros. Later, bros. This episode of the Broad Meets World was produced by Siege and edited by Tony Curtis. Broad Meets World is a two free tokens media production. Bye. 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 When the spawn meets world.